Guys, thank you so much for being here tonight for First Tuesdays with the Midwest Independent Film Festival. My name is Mike McNamara. I'm the co-founder and director of programming. So, uh, okay. It was a lot of fight to get everyone out here tonight, um, but uh, that was it? Oh, it was a fight to get everyone out here tonight. Very good. This is what happened when you sit next to writers. Uh, Alex, um, so basically, uh, as you guys know, we've been, we're pretty much sold out every first Tuesday uh, since we started this thing back in 2005. Tonight we had to make some special arrangements because there's this, some sort of event going on that has something to do with the country. And, uh, but, uh, so we moved the whole schedule up from six o'clock to five o'clock and uh, kind of put together a very special panel tonight to encourage all of you to leave work early you know, tell your boss to relax, you'll be back tomorrow and just leave a little bit early to enjoy this. Uh, we always have a producer's panel here in the theater prior to our film screening. Sometimes uh, we'll talk about film financing, other times we're talking about production or casting. Uh, we always get uh, two or three stalwarts in the independent film and production industry to come together and kind of share their war stories and, and their experiences in the industry. Well, tonight we have one hell of a panel, and I'm so excited that you guys are here to enjoy it. I'm gonna introduce these guys, and then I'm gonna let it rip. Uh, this gentleman, and it's also a nice uh, juxtaposition here. Uh, this gentleman, uh, Mr. Alex Bay, is currently in post-production on his first feature, which he wrote and directed and stars in. It's called Warren. Uh, he shot it here um, and was adamant about shooting it here, and he's currently in production with the good folks at Beast Editorial, who are one of our best sponsors. And uh, we also so, uh, showed uh, Alex's short film, Sugar, a couple years ago, and we're going to show your next short, uh, Coffees, in 2013. So please welcome Alex Bay. The man to his right, perhaps you've heard of him. You know, if I rattled off all your credits, it would take me an hour and a half. So the big ones... Go ahead, do it. All right, do it. <laughs> Academy Award nominated for directing a wonderful short film. Uh, he's directed episodes of House, 24, Sons of Anarchy. Uh, he's, as an actor... You know, I tried looking through IMDb to kind of whittle it down, but it's, uh, it's like six pages long. It's one of those six page long IMDb's. But he's gonna be in the next Star Trek as an actor. Uh, as an actor was uh, nominated, uh, an ensemble nomination as part of the cast of Dexter. Uh, also did this thing called Robocop, which people, I think a few people saw as well. Actually, brilliant movie. It's the 25th anniversary, I just saw it. I hadn't seen it in 20 years, man. So. And he's in town uh, directing an episode of Mob Doctor, uh, the new show on Fox that's airing right now. More importantly, he starts shooting tomorrow, and he said, fuck it, I'm gonna come over here and spend an hour with you guys because I wanna talk about film. So please welcome Mr. Peter Weller. Uh, I, I only could come on the contingency that I brought my wonderful first AD, John Pontrelli. Raise your hand, John. Where's John? John me, so he may, says we have a little location scout tonight. And my dear friend and driver, Gus Demas. Raise your hand, Gus. And these two guys are watching out for me to make sure that I get home safely and, you know, don't, you know, I don't know. Safely, more or me. less. More or less. Last but not least, our moderator for tonight, a big supporter of our fest. We love her. Uh, she's the kind of movie, film, television, and theater beat editor and uh, cover for the Chicago Tribune. And uh, she's taking time out of her busy schedule to be here. Please welcome Ms. Nina Metz. All right, all yours. Good luck with these two uh, strapping young men here. Oh, geez. Here we go. Let's get going. All right. Uh, Peter, you're a man who is, um, you're never a man without words, so I'm going to start with Alex, briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Alex Bay, you are a native of the North Shore. You grew si. up here. You went to New Trier. Si. Uh, you went away to go to college and then came back here to study improv. Tell us how that inspired this film that you're working on now. Uh, well, um, well, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it, the film centers around actually a uh, an old improv player uh, guy who's kind of floating around in in, the, in his late twenties uh, in Chicago, and uh, he kind of gave up improv like five years ago. And so it's kind of a uh, a story that kind of came out of a, a time that I was, um, you know, it's, it's it's got some some you know some personal elements to it. Um, and I wrote it in the middle of kind of being involved with a lot of, doing a lot of improv, and I just love uh, improv, and I've uh, kind of admired them for improvisers for a long time. And um, it's, uh, it's a story about kind of 
being stuck in, in your life and where you're, you know, kind of figuring out what to do with it next. Um, and I think uh, I uh, was in that place a little bit when I was doing that. You currently live in Los Angeles. That's right. But wrote the film set in Chicago. That's right, yeah. As you were sort of um, gathering financing for the film, mm -hmm. what did you run, what kind of responses did you get when you said you wanted a film in Chicago? Uh, well, actually, at first, uh, a lot of LA producers were like, "Why not shoot the, uh, you know, shoot the exteriors there and shoot all of it in LA?" And uh, you know, why, why can't you just change it for LA? And I just, I just never could see the movie happening anywhere else. Um, I grew up uh, around, you know, I grew up. Well, my mom's a drama teacher. I grew up going to plays and theater here and, and all that. And I, uh, um, I've always admired, you know, John Hughes, and I've always seen uh, something very interesting about the North Shore of Chicago and. Um, stories about a family that was, uh, well, a guy who was raised on the North Shore, and um, I've always seen a lot of interesting things um, come from, from growing up there. And so the stories about kind of the specifics of um, what happens as a uh, young adult who's grown up in the North Shore but uh, is now trying to face what to do with his life. And, um, but that's also something that I think is very universal. I mean, Cameron and Ferris Bueller's Day Off, uh, the kids in Breakfast Club, all those kids, yeah, that you know, it takes place on the North Shore, but it's something that I think everyone can relate to, and I think there's something uh, specific yet universal about growing up um, or having just suburban problems, so to speak. Sure. Um, and I think there's something really interesting and specific about growing up in Chicago and in the suburbs of uh, Chicago. Um, there was a story in the Hollywood Reporter. I don't know if anyone saw it a couple weeks ago about um, noting the uptick in projects that are filming in Chicago. Um, I think some of that probably has to do with the incentive, um, also the building out of Cinespace, which is a local soundstage mm -hmm. complex. But I'm wondering, um, actually, uh, someone from The Bob Doctor was quoted in that as well. Uh, Rob Wright, I believe. Yeah, he's supposed to be with us. Producers? Yeah, he's a great old friend. As the guy who actually hired me, and he's supposed to be with us here tonight, but what's he doing? Eating linguine someplace? And well, you can't blame them. Mm. But uh, mm. I'm wondering, do, I wonder how much of a sense there was of, okay, you know, there's stuff going on in Chicago. It, it feels legitimate enough. Dark Knight sort of helped usher some of that in, I think, Transformers. Um, sure. On an indie level, do you sense any kind of, um, okay, go there, do it? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, I've always respected production uh, crews and, and people here. I, I mean, this is a hardworking town. I mean, the crews here are amazing. Uh, we had an amazing 35, 40 person crew every day. We, uh, we had a blast, um, but m through raising money, I mean, the, the tax incentive was huge. Um, Betsy Steinberg was massive and helpful. Uh, you know, Richard Moskal, who I've known for a long time, these, all the, they've all been very supportive of this project. And uh, first thing we did was when we were um, getting things geared up once we had the money raised was hire uh, Vale Romaine who's our, who was our UPM line producer who's fantastic and um, I mean without her this movie uh, I mean, it wouldn't have been it wouldn't have happened the way it did um, but uh, the crews in Chicago were fantastic and, and um, yeah I felt I mean complete support here so I'm gonna ask a question that I think sort of will bridge sort of both your experiences maybe Alex you can answer first you wrote the film and you starred in it, and you directed yourself. Right. Talk about that experience. Is that preferable to direct yourself? Is that adding too many complications at times? What was the experience like? I think it's manic and crazy and insane and weird. Um, but uh, I, I, in 07, I was gearing up to make a short film, and I was looking for a director. And this producer, uh, uh, actually Lee Jones, I was looking for a, a director. And she goes, why don't you just direct it? And I had read On Directing Film, and I've always thought very cinematically. So I just said, all right, and I figured it out and um, had an amazing experience and I've done it ever since. Um, and it's something that specifically you just, uh, for me the process, uh, if you want to talk, if we can talk about that I guess, uh, is write the movie, um, get produce the movie, and then direct the movie, and then act in the movie. So basically, you know, write it, prepare it, develop it, and then produce it by, you know, because no one else is going to, and uh, raise the money yourself, uh, find great people, enlist great people, make yourself look good uh, by enlisting the best, and then uh, directing is just all about preparation. I mean, you just A, have to know where to put the camera, but B, you have to prepare that shot list like crazy, and then by that, by that time, and hopefully you've 
read the script so many times that you know the lines inside and out. But uh, Peter, what about your experiences directing yourself? What about them? Wait, when was the what was the first project that you directed yourself on? Uh, short film for Showtime that was nominated. I, I just played a doctor walking through with a with a couple of lines, but. I'm about to go direct myself in this recreation of a Hawaii Five O episode from 1971, and uh, the current Hawaii Five O is is redoing it almost scene by scene, and uh, Robert, Roberto Orsi, uh, creator of it, and, and his buddy Kurtzman asked me to direct it, and then they just came up with this idea, you know, would you play the guy? He's essentially a marksman with no hands. It's the famous Jack Lord thing from the 1970, and he, he, he he's in most of the scenes. Uh, and doesn't say anything, but um, I direct myself with Longmire. Look, it's easy to direct yourself. I went to a very famous cat who is noted as having directed himself. I'm not going to say his name, because then I'm going to tell you what he said. Warren Beatty? <laughs> no. Uh, although, he's, got ideas he's about great, that. man. He's great. And he's a, kind of, he's a kind of a mentor to me. He's actually got me hired three or four times. But not him, and even if it was him, I wouldn't say it was him. So I said, listen, hey, you direct yourself, I'm gonna direct myself, uh, is uh, that easy? And the guy said, hell yes, you just have one less asshole to talk to. That's, that's right on. And uh, you know, if I'm doing this scene with me and uh, Nina and Alex, and by the way, I gotta applaud Alex, because you know, you write your own film and you direct your own film, come on. Now, that's like going to Mars, you know, you, so give me a hand. Man. You know, I, I, you know, directing your, your own thing, I go where I'm kicked, essentially, and have a lot of fun doing it, but writing your own thing and directing is that, uh, I mean, I did that with the short, but, uh, but really, if I'm doing this scene with the three of us, I mean, think about it, I got John, Pontrelli is the first AD, and he knows the shot list, and you gotta have a great first AD, because you don't rely upon that, yeah. you don't rely upon the DP to, to get it, for, but I'm, I'm relying on John, is that, you know, I rehearse this thing with a stand-in, and then we just go for it. I don't have to talk to this third guy here, because I know that what an asshole he is. So. There you go. It's, e it's easy, and it's actually fun. Yeah. I've heard you talk about sort of the importance of the physical life of a scene, sort yeah. of, as opposed to faking faking it with the stage business of washing the dishes or driving the car. I can't stand it, man. Uh, you know, I, I come from the method, pure and simple. I come from Uta Hagen, I come from Ilya Kazan. Ilya Kazan, if you don't know who he is, you have to leave now. <laughs> go, you know, go Google him. If you call yourself a film student, you've never seen a film of Ilya Kazan, we ain't ever talking again. So Ilya Kazan brought me to the studio, and these guys all come from the er early days of the group theater, and Uta, Uta does too. Uh, where in the transformation of theater from presentational melodrama to essentially a representation of personal events or character development, which is essentially brought on by Russia, and you can read a hundred years on why that happened. It's either because of the machine gun or Freud analysis or World War I or the Bolshevik Revolution, but the Russians glommed onto it first. We follow them with the group theater, and essentially naturalistic theater is born out of that. And what the fabric of an event in a scene is, is what someone is doing physically in a room. No one in life is standing around saying words in a close-up unless you look in the person right in the eye and say, Martha, we really have to go to bed now. And that's about it. Or you're gonna tell somebody you're gonna kill them. The rest of it's all based on a physical life in the room. The physical life in the room supports what you're doing emotionally and psychologically. For instance, if you are really pissed off at your spouse and you can't talk to them because you're that pissed off, notice how manically you are washing the dishes, man. <laughs> or making the bed, you know, or on the computer. And buried into that physical life, man, it is taking you away from some confrontation. And that's the crux of it. So to get actors moving physically in a room, and yeah, do you have to rehearse it for a second, make it self-conscious? Yeah, do I pick up the beans there and then pour them out, give them to Alex and then pour the beer over here? So, yeah, you gotta rehearse that. But once that starts to go and the actor is pulling it off, then the physical life, I mean the emotional life and the, and the psychological life or the intention of the scene just wails. I mean, it's like, it's like Jimi Hendrix, it's that fast. Whereas standing around saying a whole lot of words into a close-up 
is dreary and slow, and it actually buries the best actors going. So I wonder, you, you have a role in the new Star Trek film. Yeah. J.J. Uh, Abrams. I'm guessing I have a major role. That major role. All right, I'm going to ask. Will you tell matter us fact, anything I, about I, it? Matter of fact, I am the mature star, which means... The old part. You're not going to tell us anything more? About I'll say nothing more. Okay. I promised J.J. to say nothing. <laughs> uh, but J.J. So disciple. Love J.J. I would imagine there's a certain amount of CGI in the film. So when there isn't actually a, a physical world, if it's a lot of it's a green screen, how do you as an actor create that sense of uh, a true physical life? You know, that, that's really good. I have to say it was actually harder when you were doing things like with, with, with stop motion animation. And Phil Tippett, the guy who did all of Lucas's stop motion, is one of the gifts at it. Robocop, he had loaned his services for very cheap. But stop motion animation, you know, all the all Star Wars, all that stuff before computer graphics were done with little bitty puppets that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And they would shoot a movie, put bring in a big cardboard. You know, Alex would be here and they'd bring it if I'm a big monster, they'd bring in a big Peter Weller cardboard and they'd frame up with a Mitchell camera because it's got teeth like a like a dragon. Nail the thing into the ground, set, set that frame, and then Alex would fight with nothing, because they take the cardboard out and then he'd fight nothing, then they take that film, go process it, re rear project it in front of a robot, and these genius stop motion guys would sit there and say, well, let's move its arm, you know, and they move an arm, they click, click off 10 frames a day, there's 24 frames in a second. Think of how dreary that is. I'd, I'd, you know, I'd stab myself with a fork before I'd get through a day of that stuff. I, <laughs> I went to visit Phil Tibbet up in uh, San Rafael with Lucas's place, you know? You gotta be a stoner to do that kind of gig, man. You know, if you're not doing tie stick, how are you gonna sit there? I don't know. I think the antenna's a little to the left. Yeah, Bob, it, that was their day. Now it's all computer geeks, if, if you are. So when you're acting with a computer thing, uh, it's a lot easier. It's actually, you, you know, you have a screen and you have people and you can actually get something done because you have a huge canvas in which to perform and not just one frame, you know, the camera can kind of follow you around on a green screen. So it's actually a lot better than it was. You know, the computer's given us a, although it's much more costly, it's given us a lot bigger canvas in which to play as an actor, although I still hate this shit, I, you know. I mean, come on, green screen? What is that telling you? Like, it's green. For fuck's sake. Well, so let, I mean, let's talk about RoboCop in that regard. With a few exceptions, was that mostly actual physical sort of sets, whatnot yeah. that you were interacting with? Yeah, and that was all for Hooven. I just saw that movie. There's 25th anniversary of it this year, so they recreated it at UCLA with the writers, producers, for Hooven, the entire cast, because two guys wrote it. And I, for the first time in 20 years, I got out of my own sort of self-conscious performance of it and looked at this thing as uh, an anthropological event that you could watch and. 200 years. I mean, have you anybody seen Robocop lately? I forget that the first scene starts off with a news flash about uh, Pretoria, South Africa, the last vestiges of racist apartheid about to blow up a plutonium bomb and destroy every black in the country. Uh, that's heavy, man. And then the entire trope, if you will, the through line is the privatization by banks and corporations in a trickle-down theory such as that they can also control crime. And they privatize all social services like the police force, for instance, such as that they can even control that at the end. And I don't, I'm a kind of conservative Democrat, but that, to write that in 1981, that stuff is prescient today. So when I saw that film two months ago, I thought, my, and then Verhoeven, Gone. He's a medievalist, a master's degree in medieval history. If you gave that to an American director like me or like Alex, we would have shot the usual shit. Verhoeven, you know, fused it full of medieval imagery, man. Yeah, the Judaic imagery of the golem. You know, Christian imagery of Christ, the, the book of Job. He just, you know, I venture to say that film would have not been what it was without Verhoeven. But I'm looking at that movie, I'm thinking, my God, this movie, you could show this movie in 200 years, and it'll tell you what 20th century America was about especially urban life in 20th century America. I think it's pretty remarkable in the sense that it's uh, very violent. It's also very droll and funny. Really funny. Um, I mean, th those are sort of 
uh, aspects we don't always see in the same film these days. You know, if it's an action film, it doesn't always have truly smart sort of humor to it. Yeah, and, and, and also it's, look, let, let me give you a case of point. I have to get up and do this because I just saw the movie and it's fresh. I don't want to talk about Robocop except I just saw Robocop. <laughs> so this is like, this is for instance what Verhoeven did. There's a script in there and it said essentially that Nancy Allen recognized my gun twirling and she would say, Mur I assume you've seen this movie. So Nancy Allen stops me and says, Murphy, is that you? And then I'm out on the street, and Paul McCrane's robbing a gas station. The gas station blows up, and I say, you're coming with me because I know you, I know you. you know. And all of a sudden, then I have these dreams and wake up. That's not what you saw, though. Verhoeven took the dream sequence of me thrashing around and put it first. And I'm talking to him in a suite of hotel in Dallas, Texas, man. I did not get this. Believe me, I was 31 years old. I did not understand it. I totally get it now. I said, listen, Paul, you know, like, you put the dreams first, man. It's like, you know, I, I, I have to see, Na Nancy Allen has to see me, like it says in the script, and then Paul McCrane hears me, and then that starts my dreams. Medievalist study of Judeo-Christian myth, Verhoeven. He goes, no, listen, this is a film about resurrection, and whether it's about the Hebraic tale of the Golem, Book of Job, Christ, whether it's Indian myth, whatever, it's about resurrection. So here's why I'm doing this. Uh, in American movies, in American literature, you usually see this event. You see physical life or a physical reality, and events happen, and then the amnesia starts to come back because he saw Mary in the woods. Remember, gee, there's a Mary in the woods somewhere in my mind, and then he comes alive, right? That's the way we're used to it. You see, I have a physical reality, a series of physical events, and then the psychological event starts happening, and the guy comes back. Verhoeven sitting in this, in this, in this, I never forget it, in the Hyatt Hotel in 1986. And he's saying, listen, this is about progress and the theft of identity, of progress. Progress in the name of progress and science, the theft of individual identity. So they take everything from you. They take your identity and your life and your family, and your kid, which is why he did that movie. But they can't take your soul, because it's God-given. And the soul wakes up on its own. And the soul is identified in a physical world. Dig that. So I'm sitting there in the Hyatt going, whoa. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'd buy that for a dollar. I, I, I'd buy that for a dollar. I said, okay, man, you know, whatever you want. And then you see the movie, and it's the only way the movie can be. And that's I mean, that's a pretty sophisticated mindset. But that's yeah, that wouldn't have That wouldn't have been made now. That would no, not no, have been no, the way no, would have no, been made at all. It would have been completely over the top no, studio. He, no, he would have done an eight ball and a couple of hookers yeah. and remembered his best friend and, you know, gone into a thing. And then the it's probably worth noting that there is a RoboCop remake currently being made. It'll come out. Uh, a year from this February. Wish him luck. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I know I do. I really do wish him luck. But anyway, there, you, there you have it. There's uh, what Alex is about. What I'm about. You're trying to infuse your own particular vision on celluloid, and some people have it a certain way. And you always got to listen to your own committee. And I really hand it to you for listening to yours, because there's a whole bunch of people who go, no, no, you can't make that. You can't make that in Chicago. You can't go to Chicago. No, you got to be in L.A. And finally, so many people are in your committee that finally you, you finally have to have just one friend. You have to have one friend. Yeah, right. Yeah, you have to one. Yeah, I, I, I take John. John and I bond. A lot of times, directors of first ladies don't bond. John and I have particular things in common. Eric Dolphy in Venice. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the, you know the, if you don't know the former, you do know the latter. And if you don't know the latter, I'll never talk to you all again. But Eric Dolphy and Dennis, so we're walking around finding locations together. But it's rare that, a, that, that I bond with a first AD like that because I know that the guy's sensibility is on my wavelength and I'm looking for a particular shot downtown by the river. Tonight we're going downtown by the river. Yeah. Find a new shot, you find one like that, right? Yeah. yeah. And then. Then you have to, they believe it. They, they believe it, it, yeah. They believe it, and then everyone else has to. And then everyone your ass is hung out to dry, that's you right. can come and save it. That's hopefully. Right. And if he doesn't, yeah. I got friends. Yeah, that, that's, not, that's something interesting about that that I learned a, a few years ago. I was, uh, my film, Sugar, was in a festival, a Ben Film Festival, and the guy, this guy, Kevin Fox, who executive produced the Blair Witch Project, just saw it and flipped out over it and completely championed it, won the festival. 
and and he he taught me the the importance of advocacy of having an advocate and he he was the kind of guy that say, saying in LA or in the film business you just have to have people that be, believe completely in you that you have you like you're saying one friend um, for instance my friend John Michaels over there has done every he's done titles on all my films he's kept he's kept at it he's put money into my films he's been yeah but do you the, listen he, to him he's been on the mission he listens to me too but and I listen to him do you listen to him when he comes up and says we're fucked yeah. But I, you know, I just keep going. Okay, um, that's right. And I don't care. I don't listen to that stuff. But I, I kind of do. But, uh, but you know, just uh, on this film, uh, I kind of felt uh, like I, th I found a few people along the way that just continued along with me and kept on it with me. And it was, was that's what gets these movies made. You, you I mean, if you're alone, if you're fully alone, uh, you are fucked. But uh, if if you just find people that just keep believing, even your friends that read the script and they keep telling you, no, you have to tell the story. You have to tell yeah. the story. Because at, at times you're about to go into production, you're thinking, is this location worth it? Is this line worth it? Is this actor? I mean, it, this actor is now asking questions about my script, and, and you're going, uh, you know. And then you you have to remember that, you know, sometimes you just don't believe that the story is worth all this. Trouble, all this trouble, but uh, there's something inside of you still that keeps going and goes, no, I have Do you I start, do you start, like, I start every gig mm -hmm. in terror. Terror. Yeah, total terror. terror total total trembling terror. terror. Yeah. Total, I mean, uh, absolute I was, terror. I'm having, Angela's cutting my film right here at Beast, and um, I've been, in, I've had a whole new set of terrorizing fears yeah, since yeah, making sure. this movie. Sure. F fear, misery, like, I mean, yeah. having... Nightmares about shots. Night I had a nightmare about my AD. I had, like not knowing where my AD was during production. I, I, w I had a nightmare not knowing that if he was. It was just it was crazy. And and uh, you know th there's a whole new set of fears now. It's it's the bullshit that you always hear about people going. Are, you know are, are people going to like the movie? And, that, and you say that doesn't matter. But it it does. And it down down there it does. It it just it just it, what matters most is that you continue to tell the story that's on the page. And you keep you keep on the you keep on the track, and the the people around you are the ones that help you stay on the track. Otherwise, you know, you, you're screwed. But Peter, you've sort of created a nice career for yourself, where you have uh, all these sort of tremendous acting roles, and then also a really nice career as a director of episodic television. Um, how have you sort of pursued and focused on episodic television, which I think creates a different circumstance where you can't always select these people to surround yourself with. You sort of walk into an already established uh, crew. Right? No, and that's why you're fortunate if you get somebody, I just want to tell, like, you know, Gus is a great friend. The Teamsters Union is my first union. I want to say hello to the team. I, I'm a union guy. I paid my way through college as a, as a forklift operator for Railway Express in Dallas, Texas. Teamsters are my first brotherhood, if you will. So Gus is my guest tonight. But if you find somebody like John, uh, a, you know, great first AD who's got taste and also knows how fast you want to go, and what your sort of immediacy of execution is, then, then, then you're lucky because in episodic television, man, you're the wild card. All this crew and actors, they've all been together, they've all bonded, they all know their deal. If you're lucky enough to get a season when it's first, in its first season, everybody's trying to find, can't tell their ass from both hands, then you're lucky. Uh, you know, Mob Doctor's that, it's this first season, Longmire's that. Uh, you know, I sort of got in on the ground road of Sons of Anarchy. Anybody watch Sons of Anarchy? Yeah. Let me tell you something. The extras are real hell's angels. The black guys are real crips. Where are you gonna find 15 guys who can fire a Glock in a bar? That's a real deal. The, the Mexican bike gang is a real Mexican bike gang. All those, the, ball, the women on that show have balls that clank. <laughs> the directing of Sons of Anarchy is not for the faint of heart. I direct a quarter of their episodes a year, we see Number one television directors come in and out of there and go. They're gone. They're gone in a second because they can't handle. It's a bag of cats directing that show. It's, Write it's that organizing, down. Write that down. but not kittens, man. Tomcats, man. I mean. Is it that they uh, simply sort of don't fall in line the way a, a group of actors? No, they might? don't. They don't. That's a that's a show about everything. It's a show about racist, biker, homophobic, heavy right wing, trickle down, deregulated illegal politics. It's also the theater of the absurd Ionesco, the life of dignity amongst cockroaches. It's Janae, the maid. You know, it's on so many levels and you've got people, eight, eight actors who have an opinion and as soon as the Hells Angels walk in, then the stallion mentality starts, you know, with the actors. Because, and with me too, you know, the second that five guys, look, if you have a scene where you have 
eight choppers. To hire those bikes, get eight Teamsters, get the trucks to move them, cost you a quarter of a million dollars a day. You call up the local South California, SoCal chapter of the Hells Angels. I need eight guys here with five bikes for paying them $250 a day. You come on set, I want those five bikes over here, done. Right? All those guys do is go off in a corner and smoke reefer all day and come back and move their bikes. The other way, but the second that they're on the set, all the actors got to go, me too, man. You know, the Hells Angels, the Crips are here, man. Bandanas and stuff. And me, I get like, whoa, oh, no. No, I sort of inflate myself. So when the actors and the actresses start to inflate around this stuff, you have like 18 balloons running around you, man, that you have to anchor down. And it is, it's like, uh, uh, I would it's imagine like, a Sons of it's Anarchy. It's a Lewis Black stand-up act, is what it is. But I would imagine on Sons of Anarchy, uh, you're allowed to sort of create that physical life that you really value. So I, totally they're free. riding their bike. Totally free. Totally free, man. They're, they're up for anything. They're absolutely up to inventing the room. And you could shoot. I mean, that, but Alex was saying now, we just, but John and I just finished a tone meeting where one of the execs back in LA said, I was explaining this thing where there's a kidnapping and there's seen a mob doctor and he's going to kidnap these all small claustrophobic rooms with a couple of gunsels that don't like this kid, want to kill him, and she's trying to stop it. Shoot this whole thing handheld. And they about had a shit fit in LA that I was going to shoot this handheld. And I went, no, no, you're going to shoot all five of those scenes handheld. And, and, and I had to stop. I mean, he doesn't have to do it. I mean, this is what you got to do as a director. You have to stop. I'm talking to people in Los Angeles. They're nice people, man, but they're, all of a sudden they're thinking, what are we shooting here, Jean-Luc Godard? Are we shooting some elegant you know, hospital thing? I said, listen, the elegance appears, these liquid dolly shots is all through the hospital and in the boutiques and in the cafes. We're doing all that, man. It's, it's all hinging dolly, beautiful stuff. When you, I have to explain this now. And this is a bitch. Is it, any of you guys want to be a director, man? You have to do this. He knows this. You have to be political, man. You just can't go off and be Stanley Kubrick. And so, yeah, make no, you don't movie. get to be. You don't no, get you don't to get be. to be. You gotta go talk to people and who don't understand you, and say, "Give me your money." <laughs> Give me your money yeah. with a gun. And when they to hold the gun to their okay, head. Okay. And when they just called me an hour ago and John and said, "Well, we gave you the money, and what the hell are you shooting this handheld for?" Be really quiet. Pull back and say, "Well, look, those are the five scenes where these events happen. They're very antagonistic, very electric, really immediate." real urgent life and death things about a kidnapped kid where people are yelling at each other. You got no time to put this camera on a dolly, shoot it with a steady cam, and be liquid and beautiful about it. It's not about beautiful events. Subsequently, the more it's hinging one person talking into another, handheld like a docudrama, those scenes will light up. So the three people sit back and go, okay, and I walk out of the room <clears throat> and I think to myself, is there ever going to come a day where I don't have to explain this? You know, where somebody's just going to go, oh, yeah, I get it. No, there's not. Because, as Alex will tell you, anybody in the film business, any of you young film people out there, not everybody is going to be up to your film vocabulary. Not everybody's going to be up to your acting thing. Not every actor who walks on the set is going to know what you, how to do what you do. Not everybody's going to be an improv guy like him. You know, so you have to wear all these cockamamie for cock the hats, man, and, and be very political. And that said, then you turn to somebody like John, and you are really thankful that you got a buddy on a set with you covering your ass. That's right. That's right. We got to this terror zone before production, a complete terror, horror terror, zone. Terror. Horror zone. I mean, three, four weeks out, and I, and I, ha I was furious at everybody. Uh, you know, producers not doing what they should be doing. Uh, whatever, ignoring all sorts of stuff, not feeling heard. That happens sometimes. And and uh, and and one of my producers, my main guy, my advocate, uh, two of, was two actually. One, Orion Williams, who produced Control, is one of my best friends. And Mark Hanna, I don't know if he's here tonight, but he's he was one of my right hand guys throughout the whole thing. Um, but Mark and I were talking. It was just like, do you want a do you want a movie poster next year, or do you want a script still on your shelf? I mean, do you want the movie made, or do you want the script still on your shelf? And uh, that's where the politics came in. It's just saying, all right, I mean, I gotta, I, you have to end up giving some uh, while you take a lot. I mean, 98% of what I wanted happened. I mean, it's like amazing, you know. But but I had to give up. You have to give up stuff here and there, and and you just give in and say, I'd rather have the movie made than have this, you know, the old town alehouse, the location I wanted to shoot at, and. 
just didn't work. I mean, instead, yeah, it got, so it many, got a better place, you know. So. There's, there's so many high roads you can take because yeah. down at the bottom of it, the low road you have to protect is the integrity of the movie. That's right. Just, you know, so if somebody says you can't have location, find something else. Yeah, but I want my toy. Yeah. You know, I want that shot of that bridge. Oh, there you go. Peter, hey. before I open it up for questions, uh, you mentioned something that sounded intriguing. On the mob doctor, are there different visual signatures for the hospital scenes versus the mob scenes? Yeah, I think there are. I, I mean, I have to pick and choose at the dynamic of each of the scene, but yes, there's two different worlds there. That's the gift of the show is that there's a woman straddling both worlds, and, and it happens in Chicago. She had le, 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 the, the, the legit world of surgery, and yet, you know, working for this particular omerta that she owes. I don't think it's necessarily a distinction in visual style between the two, but certain scenes within the immediacy of the mob stories, which are more violent and kinetic, demand a different style. Okay, great. Uh, we have time for some questions. People want to talk to you? Sure, right back there. Obviously, Peter, you come out of a theater background. Yeah. Which used to be a hell of a lot more common than it is now. I, I, the sense is there's a greater and greater split among younger actors and, and also filmmakers uh, that aren't coming out of the theater background as much as they used to. Uh, how does that impact what you do? Well, it, you know, it used to impact a lot. When I first started directing, you could tell night and day somebody that had a physical training in the theater and somebody just who's used to standing around in close-ups. So, you know, I'd meet an actor and I'd say, uh, you know, just keep peeling the carrots there. Peeling the carrots. And I said, well, I got to talk to the guy. I said, just talk while you're peeling the carrots. So you'd have to take that time out. Nowadays, though, I'm, I'm meeting more and more actors who do not come from the theater, ironically. And I don't know where they're getting their training but they're very physically adept in a space and very inventive. Uh, there's a kid now, Jesse, who's playing on Chicago Fire, one of the leads on Chicago Fire was on House, and I was directing the, the, the climax, climactic of eight years with hookers and Are you talking about Jesse Spencer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, hookers Spen and beatdowns and car wrecks and so on. I don't do warm and fuzzy well. You get this so far, you get the idea here, man. You know, the, the boy and girl holding hands and the, you know, it's not my deal. They don't hire me for that. So Jesse, you know, has done eight years of house, and I got, you know, this episode I had was lickety split, and he ends up leaving the hospital after eight years. I had him buried in physical life. For the first two days, he said, you know, moving all this stuff and doing that, man, I really like to stay. I said, listen, you, he has gifts for it. Now, he's not used to that, and I don't think he comes from the theater. But his training in that show got him to where he got used to it, and a particular training that he was executing in my show, he got as good as any actor I've ever seen. Because he had to move dollies, prepare surgeries, continue talking there, and all kinds of complicated stuff that he got down in a second. And I had to take him aside. I said, listen, when you go off to do Chicago Fire, you're not going to be protected. There's a lot of doofus directors who just want to throw you into some dumbass close-up just so they can finish their day and make a fairly boring deal. You've got to find it for yourself. Because you're really, really good at it, and I hope he has. And so now I don't know if the theater is the requisite anymore. It's a very good question. Because I've seen a lot of actors that don't come from the theater, but are very physically adept in the space. Any other questions? Sure, right there. Uh, my name is Jorge. Uh, my question is, when you come to Chicago and you're directing, is there any platform that you use, that you go to before you go to the, before you start your day at work? Do you use, uh, like specifically, do you go to Center City? Do you go to Goodman? Do you go see the actors in Chicago? He, he, he asked about uh, if Peter goes to yes, me or Alan. Uh, either one. If, if, uh, if they go to various local theater companies, the Goodman Second City, to sort of get a sense of who the actors are in town. Give that to Alex first because he. Well, I I, uh, I go see improv a lot. I go to Second City a lot. Uh, I go to I go see shows sometimes at I O, but I, I I well UCB in L A too. I go, uh, but I like to watch movies a lot and just kind of soak in tone of what other directors are doing, what kind of, what are actors doing in films and things like that. But uh, I, I didn't, well, we didn't have a lot of time. Um, I got into town three or four weeks before shoot, and that was what we had for pre-production. So, uh, but it is a good idea. I like to, I like to do that, go check out a show sometimes. Um, theater for sure is really cool to do because it just really, you just see rich 
acting performances, which is really enriching. Um, but yeah, if you're, looking, if you're looking to cast your feature oh. and you're looking for a good casting uh, director, African American in his mid 60s, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's needle in a haystack if you're going to bounce around to different theaters. No, uh, just just know. a good casting director. Good sure. casting director, yeah. fine. I, I don't cast. They wanted to cast Mob Doctor, one of these roles out of L.A., and I saw a guy that just kind of nailed this audition. But I, I've acted in Chicago. I did a play in 1977, David Mamet's The Woods with Patti LuPone. We originated that here. And then I did at the Goodman Frank's home, Richard Nelson's play by Frank Lloyd Wright. So I'm, I'm in, I, I feel inured to the Chicago theater scene. And uh, also got to just say, you guys got a remarkable city. Hard work. city that, Hard working yeah, but a city that had turned to shit in the 70s, man. It was like New York. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't walk from Lincoln Park downtown in 1977 when I was working here, man. I mean, this place was like pockets of evil. That was like, you know, it was like New York. All of a sudden, I come back in 2006 to do Frank's home. You know, the day I got off the plane, got to this little uh, uh, hotel, man. You know, I'm walking down the street, walking downtown. I threw my cigar in the street. This woman says, uh, excuse me, uh, yeah? She says, do you see any other cigar butts in this street? You know, Pardon the fuck out of me. Right? So I pick up the cigar. And then, uh, you know, I, I start walking around Chicago and I said, holy cow, what a transformation. I mean, the river life, the, the museum life, the restoration of downtown. What you've done on the south side of this thing, man, is like, um, I, I know you guys live here and you're inundated with it, but I'm telling you the distinction in 30 years of what has happened to this city is, uh, is like an exponent in the world of, of, of urban transformation. It's astounding. Let's end it on that. Let's hear it for this wonderful panel tonight, you guys. <laughs> Peter, Alex, you managed to pack the house on election night. That's pretty awesome. Thank you so much.